Good afternoon for everybody which was not present during the previous session. So we will start again a new talk related to this um, day, which is related to Industry 4.0. And I will introduce you Ripir Sink, which comes from USA. And he will try to explain you um, some information related to his area of uh, competence. And uh, in fact, the, the translator will be hopefully running well now. So let's try. And Ripi, you are welcome to start your presentation uh, during one hour, one hour and ten, and then we will have some questions. Is it okay for you? Yes. Very good. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you for having me. Are you all able to see my screen and read the captions? Thank you. Okay, it is uh, really a pleasure to be here today in this uh, two-day activity that Sergey has organized around Industry 4.0. We just heard Ramon around business models. Some of the content he shared is common with what I am talking, including its application to the NDT area. So this is good. Uh, if there are things that I am not able to successfully tell, you can always go back to Ramon's presentation and pick it from there. Thank you, Ramon. What is NDE 4.0? A simplest way to define that is if I bring industry 4.0 technologies into the NDT, the non-destructive evaluation, non-destructive testing domain, I call it NDE 4.0. This uh, term was first presented, I believe, by um, Germans. Norbert Meindorf used it in Singapore in 2017 as the application. Uh, in the parallel, I used it in 2018 in America. And then later 2018, Norbert and I got together and started collaborating and more collaborations since then have come to a point where we now have 15 to 20 countries collaborating to develop what the future of NDT 4.0 will look like. Ramon, who just gave a talk, and Sergey are both a part of that team. What I am going to share with you is some perspective which is still evolving, which will change in the next few years. And I'll share that with you today and leave you with some things to consider around why, what, and how to go about the NDE 4.0. The philosophy that I will share with you today is truly an industry 4.0 philosophy and you can apply it to any industrial domain that you later on pursue. So it's pretty broad. Let's begin with, we all know the definition of industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. But just to recap, the first one was powered by steam. Some mechanization started at that point. The second one was powered by electricity. And the third one was powered by computers. What's the fourth one? Let me share with you a slightly different perspective. In the second industrial revolution, humanity learned how to deal with material, physical things, mass production of physical products. During the third revolution, humanity learned how to deal with data, with digital world, with cyber space, with information, things that you cannot see or touch, but you read and you feel and you communicate. 
So second revolution was about physical world. The third revolution was about digital world. The fourth revolution is about the intersection of digital and the physical world, okay? In the fourth revolution, it's a closed loop between what's happening in the digital world, in the computers, and what's happening in reality in the physical space. And the two are so connected. That is what is fourth revolution. So if you understand the concept of where the fourth revolution is going, a lot of your applications become very simple. What does it mean to inspection is what I would talk today. From inspection perspective, in the earlier times, actually, if you go 2000 years ago, 5000 years ago, we were not really inspecting things, but we were responding to, oh, there's a noise, the tree fell. Oh, something broke. You heard it, you reacted to it afterwards. But the real inspection things started with what we call visual inspections. In the beginning, you take a, uh, a lens, an optical lens, and you go specifically look at something and make some notes and see whether a particular product is okay or not. Take the example of a railroad, okay? You used to physically go check for damage in the axle and in the wheel. In the second revolution, we got analog devices where we could amplify what is happening with the material. And we could also see behind the surface, okay? With ultrasonic, with eddy current, you could look behind the upper surface of any article. <clears throat> the third revolution in inspection system from the digital side came with things like digital imaging, thermography, with digital x-ray. Now we started to capture the data and store it in computers, watch it on screen, analyze it through numerical algorithms. So that's how we defined now going back, right? These definition of NDI one, two, three were not given 20 years ago. We have recently given those definitions so that we could differentiate the NDE4 from NDE3 and 2. In NDE4, we talk about bringing in artificial intelligence, robotics, augmented reality, internet of things, 3D printing. Bring all those to help you with inspection system. That's what we will talk about as the NDE 4.0. Is there a definition? Every time I talk about this, people say, is there a definition of NDE 4.0? The answer is a team of people, including Sergey, Ramon, me, and 10 other people, we are now converging on something that we believe will stand at least for the next few years. And that looks like it is a cyber physical non-destructive evaluation which comes out of confluence of industry 4.0 digital technologies, physical inspection methods, and business models to enhance inspection performance, integrity engineering, decision-making for safety, sustainability, and quality assurance, as well as provide relevant data required to improve design, production, and sustenance. This definition is a little bit longer than what I would like to see, but it captures the entire essence of what is NDE 4.0, how to go about doing it, and why you should pursue it. The next one hour of my talk will work through each one of these why, how, and what steps. By the way, this definition is still evolving. A group of us are working on it. And when it is all finalized, it will be published in the handbook of NDE 4.0 coming out sometime in 2021 to be published by Stringer Prolog. So Simon Sinek says, you must always start with the why. That's the insight. What is the purpose? 
why should we pursue NDE 4.0? Then we'll talk about what does it contain, and then we'll find out how to go about pursuing it. So these are the three parts of my presentation today. Let's start with why. So the why for NDE 4.0 is the same as the why for Industry 4.0. So if we can understand why we are, why as a humanity, as engineering community, we pursue Industry 4.0, that should give me the reason for NDE 4.0. Interestingly, all of the technologies that we bring in, they are here to improve the quality of life for us. We want to use these technologies to give us better health care, better transportation system, better renewable energies, more affordable, sustainable cities and infrastructure, improved control on our financials, better agriculture and food, improved healthcare. After all, the developments in science and technology are driven to help society. This is actually what Japanese defined as Society 5.0. When Germany gave the concept of Industry 4.0, Japanese went on to see what really is happening is society is evolving and they defined society one, two, three, four, and five. One was hunter-gatherer 100,000 years ago. Two was agriculture society about 2,000 years ago. Third was the industrial about 200 years ago. Fourth is the information about 50 years ago. And now we are at the cusp of a societal revolution coming out of digital, physical, and biological confluence. And that's what is called Society 5.0. It's defined by Japanese as a super smart society which addresses social issues in addition to economic development. The philosophy behind this is that every time there was an industrial revolution, we may have actually created problems for the society. So how do we take the next revolution with a little conscious effort to improve the society? And let's define Society 5.0. So the technologies under Industry 4.0 are developed in a manner to support what society needs. So from that perspective, learning from the purpose of Industry 4.0, if Industry 4.0 is to give me a better life, a better society where we solve social problems and we also have healthy economic lifestyle, then the technology from NDE 4.0 should provide safety 5.0. And I define that as something which is safety solutions for infrastructure as well as economic value. So I want NDT 4.0 to bring safety along with economic value, not just safety at cost, not just safety by creating sustainability issues, but safety that also brings economic value. That is the purpose of Industry 4.0. And we talk about safety, we should talk about safety of the users and the safety of inspectors. That way you cover every stakeholder that is involved in the infrastructural system. In a typical NDE system, what happens? There is a part that may have a crack, corrosion or some other anomaly. And there's a device that is used to inspect the part you send a signal onto the part and signal and the part responds to the signal. You pick it up, you display it on some kind of a monitor, and then you apply your brains and some other tools to make a decision. So these are the four, five important steps in improving the safety. If you think about, can you use artificial intelligence or robotics or virtual reality 
or IoT or additive manufacturing to improve any piece in the system, you are moving towards NDT 4.0. That's the whole story. Why we believe it gives us safety, enhanced safety. So typically, when you have an NDT system, you have the system with some intrinsic capability, which means below some crack size, below some anomaly size, you cannot detect it. Your probability of detection is zero. And above a certain size, you can detect the crack and your POD should be one. So in principle, the NDT equipment, when it is designed and built, is made to provide some kind of a probability of detection capability. But in reality, human factors come in. And what human factors do, they change us from what is possible, like the green curve, to what really happens, which is the red line. And red line means sometimes it will detect crack that does not even exist. We have a false call. The signal was interpreted as cracked, but there was no crack. So we end up changing the part, which was still good. So the curve goes up here. And then sometimes we miss a fairly large crack. And that's why we look for what is called 1995 crack size. You think of if that's the crack size which I can detect with 90% probability and 95% confidence. I think all of the NDT students should know the concept of 1995 and system reliability. So the whole thing is a system was capable of producing green line, but in reality, it's doing red line in the field. That is the opportunity that I want to use the digital technologies, the NDT 4.0, to push the red line back towards the green line. I want to address all of the human factors so I can push the red line to the green line, right? The human factors are affected by environmental conditions, organization, people-to-people -people difference, different tasks and applications. Uh, I will not go too much detail into human factors. Maria is giving a talk later in this conference, either today or tomorrow, and she will give a lot more detail about human factors. For me, the motivation, the purpose of NDE 4.0 is to alleviate, remove some of those challenges. So I want to take red system back to green, but there is something else I can do. There is even a possibility that I can use devices to go beyond the intrinsic capability. I can enhance the capability, okay? It's through software, through artificial intelligence, through ability to distinguish extremely small signals from a high level of noise it is possible for me to even improve upon the intrinsic capability. Some people say it's not possible. Well, you, you remember when digital cameras came, they were able to see in dark, right? Because there is an ability to go beyond visual light frequency into infrared. So it is possible that digital technologies will give you capabilities that physical systems could not give you up until now. So that's what I'm looking for from NDT 4.0. I want you to understand a concept here, very strong for um, a revolution, okay? Any project, any innovation, any technology change that we do, we pick two out of three things. We either make it faster or cheaper or better, or we take Two, it is very, very difficult to get all three. So in a traditional evolutionary growth, having all three together is what I call not possible. However, during a revolution, during the transition, which is for the next eight to 10 years, it is possible to get all three together. Of course, 
you know, in 10 years from now, when NDT4 will be very common, you again will have a mature technology and you will have to choose two out of those three. But for now, it is possible to push all three. And that's why I call it safety 5.0. You're getting safety solutions as well as economic value. Safety solutions for people who use the infrastructure and people who inspect the infrastructure and economic value again for the user to reduce the life cycle cost of the infrastructure and also to use the data to change the design for future products. I'll skip this chart. That's, that's the whole motivation behind NDT 4.0, safety and economic value. I will let you take 10 second break before I go into the second part. Okay. So now we know why we are doing NDT 4.0. Let's look at what does it take. I started my talk saying the biggest thing about the fourth revolution is the digital physical confluence. Okay. The second revolution told me how to deal with physical world. The third revolution taught me how to deal with the digital world. The fourth revolution is driving me to connect the physical world with the digital world and connect the digital world back to the physical world. In a sense, think about it, a digital twin for a physical system. And the sensors in the physical system are all the time telling the computer what is happening. Computer does the analysis, does the simulation, does the predictive things, and decides if it needs to impact something in the physical world and closes the loop, taking an action in the physical world. Okay, it generates movement. Okay, classic example is a driverless car. The computer in the car is all the time watching the physical reality around the traffic, is analyzing the movement of all the other cars on the road, is predicting which way should this car move, slow down, turn, so as not to have any accident. And the computer takes the physical action by applying brakes or turning the steering wheel. That's the fourth revolution. The computer and the physical world working together to achieve an objective. Within NDE 4.0, the physical world has not changed from NDE 3.0. It's pretty much the same. And the digital world, the digital technologies, the augmented reality, artificial intelligence, they are continuously developing. But it's the combination of the two is what differentiates NDT 4.0 from NDT 3.0. There are four guiding principles that were given for the industry 4.0 about five years ago by the Germans. Interoperability, decentralized decisions, transparency, uh, and one more, I'll talk about that. I took all of those four principles and translated them for the inspection world. Effectively, bringing in the terms very specific to inspections, decision-making, inspector, so that I can adopt the guiding principles of Industry 4.0 into NDT 4.0 the interoperability. Yeah. Instead of machines and devices, it's about instruments and inspection equipment. Decentralized decisions. Instead of people, I also tell, use the term inspectors and inspection systems. Information transparency, bring in virtual reality to address physical anomalies. In terms of technical assistance, bring in robotics and drones. So the four principles given for industrial revolution can be translated into four principles for NDT 4.0. In theory, you can use the same approach 
to redefine principles for any industry. Ramon mentioned construction 4.0. We can write guiding principles for construction 4.0 just like that. Leadership 4.0, quality 4.0. We can convert these principles directly into the application domain. That's the beauty of German's original definition. So what does it mean to the future? Think about a depot where an airplane engine over here has to come in for servicing, right? Think of it as Air France depot in uh, Paris somewhere outside of Charles de Gaulle airport. And the job is that they need to maintain engines for the Airbus A320. The future depot, smart depot, this is what it would look like, okay? Depot will begin its activities even before the engine arrives. The augmented reality will guide all the activities on that asset. It will tell people what to do, where, and when. The scheduling has already ordered the spare parts and scheduled the repairs to be performed on the engine because the digital twin of the engine knows various issues that there might be. The intelligent workflow now optimizes the downtime because in this depot, there are multiple engines, there are undercarriage, there are so many devices, there are so many people, there are so many workbench to work. The intelligent workflow optimizes the utilization of time in a manner that is very efficient and effective. The components get tagging with real-time performance data Robos assist in performing the inspections and they increase the probability of detection. And then artificial intelligence is used to correlate the data from other assets. Other assets means other engines. If you see something in one engine, you can easily compare, have you seen it before, how many times? Will similar usage exist on other engines? And that really allows you to understand performance of the product. And finally, 3D printing can help you print spare parts, print tools to install right on site. Effectively, this cyber physical integration makes the entire depot, we call it smart. Right? In addition to the inspection system, you're also dealing with workflow. It makes all the difference because this can give you speed, cost, and safety, all three things that we talked 15 minutes ago. The various elements of NDT 4.0. There are methods, there are processes, and there are products. Methods, NDT methods will be enhanced with all of these technologies that we just talked about. Augmented reality, AI, IoT, 5G, inspection process. We just talked about digital workflow, supply chain, traceability. And then all of this data that you capture from field inspection gets passed on to the designers of the product so that the next generation of products is even better than what we currently have. Here is an example of a very dirty boiler that inspectors need to go inspect. If I can replace this human inspector with a robot or maybe with a drone, that actually flies in through these ugly pipes and does the inspection and comes back. I have just created a safer, a healthier environment for the inspector. That's the value proposition of robotics in inspection systems. Augmented reality, two things. It can help you see the anomalies. You know, not just the signal on the oscilloscope, which says a peak and then you say, oh, this peak is about uh, this is where I have a, an anomaly in there. You can actually convert that into a graphic visual, which can be overlaid on the physical world to see what could be wrong in the system. Here, for example, this inspector can look at it and if the diagnosis says a certain cable is broken, it can show right there, this is broken. Augmented reality can also be used to train the inspectors. Training, you know, taking you beyond computer-based training. You, you just move with your iPad on top of the product and it overlays instructions what to do 
how to do, where to do. So you can have online, real time, on the task training. So I don't have to spend a lot of energy training a lot of people. I just have to train people on how to follow augmented reality instructions. And then now same guy can inspect an airplane, can inspect an engine, can inspect a boiler, and your skills become portable. Think of artificial intelligence. Here is a picture uh, where you take a, just a simple digital picture of a pure metal pipe or under the bridge. And now the artificial intelligence is able to read the digital image and mark up what looks like an anomaly, right? You can train this thing to go even beyond looking for anomalies to identifying tagging, marking, analyzing, and even do root cause analysis on whatever is observed on a picture. Think about how humans have to go read a signal like this, which has significant amount of noise, and you have to decipher what does it mean. And human eye or human mind can only handle two or three parameters at a time. Computer can handle hundreds. So we can train the computer artificial intelligence to even pick up signal from a very, very noisy environment. What could look like a noise to human eye or ear can still be interpreted by image recognition as well as uh, signal processing, audio signal processing. So there's a power in artificial intelligence that can be used in NDT devices. There is also power in combining many things, you know, big data and AI, AI and digital imaging. I just talked about it. Combining robotics, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and internet of things. When you are able to combine those four things, you almost have a device that can substitute for an inspector. And that day will come. That day will come. I like this picture a lot. Here, one flying machine is flying around and inspecting another flying machine, right? An aerial drone to inspect an airplane. What a beauty, I don't have to go. This, this thing can fly pretty fast, pretty quick, all over, take pictures, do wide area scan, uh, look at what it is. And then some of it, it can make the judgment call. Some places it will just highlight, throw a little spotlight. So inspector comes and checks what happens. And all of this is because of synergy effects. Now, NDT3 was dealing with data, but NDT4 is more than just data. Like I mentioned, it has an association with the physical world, and we call that physical association as digital twin. And if you take digital twin every minute, every day, every hour, you can combine them you can call it a digital thread. It's a time-lapse history of an asset. Now you know everything about that asset, current state, as well as the history. You could start from the product's geometric model. You can track how it is used. You can track how it performed. You can track inspection and maintenance records. You can know everything about the system, okay? It is a scary thought. My doctor does not know everything about my health because of various reasons, but in future, we will be able to track data for each piece of it. Oh, by the way, Facebook knows a lot about you. And in some sense, Facebook is your digital twin and your digital thread in limited sense, whatever you have shared with it. The power of data is also there to enhance the business value. You can, you can do a lot of analytics to figure out how do you optimize maintenance? How do you customize maintenance? How do you perform rapid just-in-time training? All of this is generating economic value. Data models are still evolving. Our ability to share data is still a scary thought. But as we converge more and more onto business models and we begin to apply one of the principles of industry 4.0, which is transparency, with the other one, which is called interoperability, 
and, and we realize the value, the benefit, we will be able to go to next level in, uh, in, in economic value and business value. What I mean by that, if you think of last hundred years, data can be descriptive. It can tell you what happened and I call it level one. It's just early stage, something broke, okay? You checked, it's in two pieces. Yeah, it's two pieces, it's broken. I know what happened. I can go figure out why it happened. I can do some diagnostics. Or if it's not fully broken, I can do some predictive things and figure out what will happen. I call it level three. Level four is I can now tell others what to do. So I can be prescriptive in, hey, don't drive like this, drive like that. Don't pour this acid on it. Do not do this. So I can actually prescribe what to do, what not to do. And level five is what I call cognitive. What don't we know? This is where I talk about things like artificial intelligence. They are able to see stuff that we as humans are not able to see. They are able to look into the blind spots, which otherwise are hard. And NDT 4.0 is to drive our ability to deal with data from whatever level you are up and up and up and up. That's what we want to do. So that's what NDT 4.0 is all about. It's about digital technologies integrating with the physical world using data and monetizing data and having business models around monetizing. Okay, let's talk about the third part how to pursue NDT 4.0. Now, this part is very common to what Ramon shared with you. I will talk about very similar business tools. My process is a five step process, okay? The five step process is first, you must understand the pains and gains of the user, of the customer for whom you're trying to solve the problem. Then you generate a whole bunch of ideas, hundreds of ideas, some simple, some beautiful, some outrageous, ridiculous, some impossible, but you generate a lot of ideas. You know, you've all been in brainstorming sessions. Then from those hundreds of ideas, you find 10, 15, 20, which have a value proposition. That means they make sense to this customer. It can provide value to the customer. That's just the tool called value proposition. Ramon mentioned it. I will share with you an example I worked on. Value proposition means there is a customer out there who values your idea. Then you go to what was business model canvas one hour ago. I call it concept qualification. It's a slightly different tool, but same philosophy. Concept qualification means, okay, that idea is good for the customer. Is it good for me as a business to even pursue that? Can I do it profitably? Can I do it safely? Can I do it just in time? You know, it could be a great idea and people want it, but if you cannot do it economically, viably, financially affordable, it does not qualify. Nobody would want to do it, right? So once that qualifies, then you launch your projects. During your projects, you mitigate the risk and some projects are successful, some will not be successful. When you are particularly pursuing things like Industry 4.0, the technology is still developing, the business models are still evolving. Some projects will succeed, some will fail you have to use a portfolio approach. Realize that if I have five projects, only two or three will succeed and that is okay. Others, I will learn something. Maybe I will redo it in a different style next year and that's okay. If we don't accept failure, if we only say, I want to do a project, if it is guaranteed to be successful, 
I will tell you, you cannot revolutionize things. Revolution requires willingness to fail. Lot more failures happen. You have to accept the failure. You have to learn from it, but you have to make multiple efforts. So that's the five step process that I have been following now for about six, seven years since I started my innovation practice. I use this for all innovation projects and business models. Elements of this process are also a part of ISO 56000, which is on innovation management. Uh, that looks slightly different. They use different terms, but the idea is same. You have to go from understanding what is required and then doing it profitably and successfully. Let's look at each of these pieces separately. <clears throat> what, what does the customer need? <clears throat> In an inspection system, there are two customers and there is actually a dichotomy here, which we have to appreciate and which is actually also a driving force for NDT 4.0. An inspector, he would want an inspection system which is easy to set up, easy to learn, works no matter what the weather is. He may be inspecting bridge while it is snowing. He does not want to deal with consumables, you know, the mag particle, the dye penetrant, those materials are not very healthy. He wants to be in a clean environment. He wants to do his job really quickly. And he wants this device, the system to give him a very reliable response. And then whatever signal he sees, he wants to be able to easily interpret. Essentially, the inspector says, I don't want any pain in my job, right? All of these pains in his job is what he would like the inspection system to remove for him. So we understand inspector's pains. What about the owner or the, the head of the department which has to do the maintenance at Air France? What is he thinking? The business owner. He says, I don't want my airplane waiting at the airport for maintenance. I want it to be flying all the time. So whatever you want to inspect, do it really fast, quickly, all over, be done. I have no time for it. He wants to maximize inspection interval, right? I don't want to inspect every three months. I want to do it every year, every five years. In fact, I don't want to inspect at all. He wants zero cost, zero inspections, zero downtime. And he says, if you have to inspect, please make sure you give me a reliable information so I can make a decision. The only thing common between the inspector and his boss is they both want reliability of the data. The funny thing is he wants zero job pain. The inspector says zero job pain, but his boss says zero inspection. He doesn't even want the inspector or the inspection device. For him, inspections should be eliminated altogether. <clears throat> Think about it. Don't we feel like my car? Ah, it's good if I have to do no inspections, no maintenance. I mean, compared to 20 years ago, now I just have to do oil change once a year and I still feel, oh, why do I have to do it once a year? When, when I was growing up, we had to check our car for oil, water, things every day. Every day before I start the car, I would open the hood. I'll check if there is water in the radiator or not. Otherwise it will overheat and I'll check the oil and that's it. before driving every day. Now I have to do it once a year and I still say it is too much. Right? <clears throat> the NDT 4.0, like I mentioned before, when you go through a revolution, you can change multiple things at a time. The NDT 4.0, gives us the opportunity to resolve the inspector's pain as well as minimize or optimize the number of inspections. We can help both, not one. And these five technologies in my mind are the top five to help us do that. And we talked about this uh, about 20 minutes ago, how, they, how each one of them can help. Now, <clears throat> every expert out there has his own list. My friend Johannes will say, 
quantum computing, big data, 5G are important, right? So we can all have our own list of favorite five. These are my five. And I may change this list next year, but as of now, I think this is what we need to go towards NDT 4.0. Let's talk about this value proposition canvas that Ramon mentioned before. You got to start with what's the job to be done. And in that job, what's the pain? And now look at what is your solution on the left side? How will that solution relieve the pain? And does the solution create a gain that the customer may be willing to pay? So that's a simple framework given by strategizing. Think about an example we were looking at. Okay. <clears throat> an organization needed to remove mines from land and water. And they need a device. Their job right now is they hack, they carry eddy current device, it's handheld machine, or they even, some of them have robots and some of them have heavy moving machines that drive over land or they go like a boat on the water. They go scan for mines one at a time. And if they discover, they either take it out and disarm it or they blow it up in situ. Okay, it's gone, it's used, that's okay. The problem or the pain in doing that job is there are a lot of accidents. So the inspectors who are searching for mines are getting hurt. The terrain, the land they are, have to operate upon is very uneven. There are no roads, you can't take machines over there. The machines are giving too many false calls. You think there is a mine, you dig it, and all you find is a, a soda can, a Coca-Cola aluminum can. So there are a lot of false calls. Then after inspecting, they're not able to mark properly which area has been inspected. And there's another pain over there. They can't even identify where to go scan. So they're scanning a lot of land or water painfully taking time. <clears throat> One idea that came up with was, can we use a drone? Can we have an aerial delivery system that is an eddy current based. It can do scanning, it can do searching, and it can even deploy mechanism to diffuse the mine. And the business model was, we'll design and build this aerial drone and we will sell it. And then we will sell training. So that solution will address many of these pains. It also reduces cost and speed and that's a gain creator so although the customer was not asking for speed and cost, we know everybody would take it. They were really asking for safety and markings and false calls. I mean, it was all performance related pains that they were dealing with. This problem is so large that cost and speed was not a, not a criteria for technology selection. However, if a device can provide that, like I mentioned, the industrial revolution can give you cost, speed, performance, why not? So the whole value proposition was, we will develop a brand new wide area scan diffuse mark capability that can be rapidly deployed using drones. Great idea. People who are out in the field doing demining, they like it, absolutely. If you can do this, they will buy it. So this idea, now has a very strong value proposition. We have a good market insight, we have a good idea, and we have a strong value proposition. Does it make sense? Well, let's see if it makes sense. So we go back to uh, a business model canvas, variation of the tool that Raman shared with you. The value proposition is, I will create this product which has eddy current sensor. It, flies, it's an aerial delivery model, and I will sell that drone and I will train the drone operators. On the market side, I will sell it to the military, which is working all over the world, on land, on water, to remove mines. And I know today in the world, there are 120 million mines. And this data is real. 
in the world today, there are about 120 million minds, which means I can, there is a market for about 12,000 of these drones to identify and remove those minds. Assuming each drone can pick up 10,000 minds over a period of five years. What are people doing currently? We already talked about it. They currently use a metal detector and they use a hard ball to detonate the mine. And it costs on an average, then price for getting that done is about $300 per mine. And the eddy current device that they're using with the hard ball is about $15,000 per unit. So that's the current solution in the market. Our solution appears to be 10 times faster, sorry, five times faster, 10 times safer. And we will sell it directly to the users or through military procurement process, which starts with a request for proposal and you bid and you win or you lose depending upon the competitive position. However, we estimated that for a new technology of this type, we can get maybe 10 to 15% of the market share if we go through a direct sales channel and if we are able to create a 10 times faster, sorry, 10 times safer and a five times faster machine, right? So, you know, the way you calculate your ability to capture market share comes from your competitive advantage and your sales channel. So if I can get 10 to 15% of the market, which means I can sell about 1500 drones in the market. What does it take to make it? I have to develop, demonstrate, certify, and then sell it. I need about $40 million of investment to design, develop, and certify this drone. I need to team, test lab, sensors, all that stuff put together. So Essentially, I must invest $40 million once to make this machine. And then I estimated it will cost me about $10,000 per machine, okay? So if in the market, I cannot price it more than 15,000 because people will go with the old system. If the new system is very expensive, they will say, okay, we keep doing the old one. They may not buy it. So 15,000 is the price and 10,000 is per unit cost, and $40 million was the initial investment, I have to sell 8,000 units to make profit. But it looks like I can only sell 1,500, which means I will not make profit on this business. Great idea, aerial drone delivery, safer for people, fast, everything good, but not profitable. So this particular canvas, this particular concept qualification sheet allowed us in one page to see whether it will make business sense to pursue this idea or not. And if it does not make business sense, what do we do? We have to change something. The layout of this sheet is such that each box is connected to its neighboring box. See, this break-even point comes from cost, price, market share, market size. Market share comes from your sales channel competitive advantage. Cost comes from your efforts, resources, activities. And all this competitive advantage and resource requirement came from the value proposition. So if I can start, go left or right, and then go up and come back, and run this loop in a few iterations, I can come up with a solution that will make sense. That's how you use a canvas of this type. That is why a one page tool is so much more powerful than books of business plans that people write. When you write a 20 page business plan, you are already described it to a level where you can't change anything. In this sheet, if you change one box, you can quickly find out what else should I change? 
so that I do not lose the balance of all these boxes. Think of it is like, like a pyramid, right? All these are actually holding each other. And if you take one out, you must see what else to move so that it doesn't fall apart. So we went through a bunch of iterations and in the end we decided we change the business model. We go from, instead of selling the device, we will go lease the product and turn the data into money. So we will provide it as a service. And we also said we expand the market to include humanitarian organizations who are interested in civil safety of normal life, not just few areas of military interest, but in general areas like Afghanistan and, and those domains where now as population is spreading and they're discovering mines, right? So we could go there. Market size has not changed. My ability to capture the market also has not changed. But the way I restructured the business model, the pricing changed. And now we are able to make profit after about 1 million mines demining and with a market of about 15 million mines, this business will be profitable. So what happened? We actually discovered that the profit is not necessarily in creating the product. The profit is in selling the service. So we changed the business model from product to service size and make it a profitable unit. Same activities, same product, same resources, but the way you deliver to the customer, we change that. So I have, I have applied this tool about 20 times in the last five years. And every time the solution is different. Sometimes it's a technology solution. Sometimes it's a business model solution. Sometimes it is a resource solution. We have to play with these boxes to see what makes sense. But in the end, this box is what connects the break-even point to the value proposition and everything else. This is your inside activities. Ramon called it back-end or corporate size. This is the front-end activities or the market side. The top rows are all about ideas. The bottom row is all about money. Right? And each box, the vertical boxes are derived from top to bottom and the horizontal boxes are left to right. So the connectivity of the boxes is the key behind this tool. Very effective, please use it. All right, let's switch gears again. When we have to ask these value proposition questions and concept qualification questions, the answer is more than technology, okay? Remember we talked about safety, we talked about society. So we have to think more than technology. Even if you were just talking about robotics, you must ask a question, how will robotics change NDE in five to 10 years from now? Because you have to take that into your concept qualification sheet. First question, we just just talking about it. System, what's the method? What's the product? What's the process? Always think at system level first. Is the current system, current technology becoming obsolete? How do you go from obsolescence to emerging? Second, skill set. You can get the technology, but if you don't have the skill set to operate the technology, it will not be successful. So you have to think about how do you go from aging to retraining? Repeating is aging. Okay, so repeating goes to school regularly and retrains and reskills himself by hanging out with people like Sergey and others and learning from everybody around the world. Third, business models, they are shifting from traditional to disruptive. The example we just gave, we talked about going from product to service. And finally, all of these three things, system, skills, and business model, you must make sure that they address customer experience. You want to take the customer from being a satisfied customer to somebody who's delighted, somebody who's even anxious about what you're doing and how will you do it differently, okay? And there's one thing that I would like to add, which is at the core, and that's ethics. We have to do the right things in the right way. 
Industry 4.0 is raising some serious questions around ethics. Be careful of how you decide, what you decide, what you choose to do. It has implications larger than we can think of. Now, in your pursuit of Industry 4.0 technology, you know, I mentioned to you that I've done 10 projects with uh, with using the concept qualification sheet. Half of the time, we are suddenly able to change the game by bringing in a smartphone, okay? Most digital technologies would require a few things. They require internet connection, they require something to store data, they require something to interface, input and output of data, audio visual. All of those things exist in a smartphone and it's available for $500, $600, $1,000, and it is continuously developing. So I don't have to redevelop any of these things, right? So every time, even the aerial drone project, when you think about it, we says, okay, how many components can be removed and replaced by just putting in a smartphone in there? I'll just plug that in the system. One of the powerful things, I call, I call smartphone as a wheel in the fourth industrial revolution. And there is no need to reinvent the wheel. Just reapply it in a different fashion. There are a lot of challenges in this pursuit. The number one challenge is technology system connectivity. How machines will talk to machines on data protocol. I do not know a lot about it, but I am seriously waiting for protocols like HL7 or OPC UA so that machines connect with each other better. Look at what industry 3.0 told us. That revolution started in 1969. The internet existed in 1964. The ARPANET was popular by 67, but within just US military domains. It took 20 years for it to become popular just because it had to wait for HTML to develop. HTML, hypertext markup language, that was the standard that allowed people to communicate, that allowed people to write data on their own machine, leave it there, and something will still be able to read, interpret, and demonstrate. I am waiting for something equivalent of that. When we get things like OPC UA or its derivative as an accepted communication protocol for data exchange, we will explode just like HTML allowed internet to explode. Talent, we briefly touched upon it. Another major challenge with industry 4.0. It needs completely new set of skills, okay? Our experience from industry 3.0, Equipment manufacturers acted as trainers, okay? It, it was relatively simpler transformation. It was slower. This one's much faster, and this one is much more complicated. But there is help coming in. You know, I mentioned how augmented reality can train us. I'm just hoping that artificial intelligence and augmented reality takes the training job away from the tedious effort of create the content, classroom training, practical training, will get completely replaced. So the industry 4.0 in itself can help us develop better training. Leadership styles. Ramon did touch upon that a little bit. Okay. In industrial revolution, the leadership changes significantly. And what we learned from 3.0 is the leaders either evolved or they disappeared. They completely went out of business. Same thing will happen with industry 4.0. They will either evolve or perish. The traditional ways of a hierarchical structure, boss tells you what to do, then the director, then the manager, then the engineer is not gonna work. Competition is highly unpredictable. Technology is changing fast. Communication needs to be real time. We need what some people are beginning to call leadership 4.0 simply a different way of leading organizations and people through the fourth revolution. Finally, culture. We really need to make uh, 
open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our mind to actually adopting a totally new way of doing things. It's no joke. When third revolution came, computers came, I was in school and I was young, enthusiastic. I was running after them. I was adopting. Great. Now I'm in my fifties and I feel like, oh, why do I have to change? This will never come. I, you know, there are, there are days I wake up thinking maybe I can live without making that change. So change, change is hard, but society is changing and, and the workplace culture is even harder. We have to be very conscious of that, both in terms of people who are developing NDT 4.0, industry 4.0 technologies, as well as companies that have to adopt. There will be new problems that we don't even know as of now. As the human role changes from doing the job to controlling the machines that do the job, to programming the machines that do the job, there will be additional problems that we don't know yet. We have to figure it out. We will learn. I don't know how I will behave if my boss happens to be a robot. Will I take instruction from a robot that says, good morning, Mr. Rippy Singh, we would like for you to go there today and do such and such job. Go to hell, I'm not taking orders from a machine. Right? It may not work, right? There'll be also unforeseen technical challenges. The robots may start deciding on their own. If I put artificial intelligence and robot together, there is a real fear the machine can go out of control. Elon Musk will tell you all the time that artificial intelligence will go so far ahead that we will be looking at it the way monkey looks at a clock. Okay, something is moving, but I don't know what it is telling me, right? You know, just think about monkey staring at clock and trying to figure out what's going on. That could be the case with humans if the artificial intelligence and robots take over a system. It's a real fear. And so what does it take to go through all those challenges? I think what we need today is a community coming together because this problem is larger than any one of us being able to handle it. There's a serious thought leadership happening on NDE 4.0. There's a global ambassadors program that we are involved in. And so many individuals are running committees around the world. And it is very wonderful. It's very pleasing to see actually Industry 4.0 bringing people together to share knowledge, to create special issues of conferences, uh, create special issues of magazines, publish it. And a lot of this work that we are talking today and what we are publishing today, it may be obsolete in two years. It may be wrong in five years, but it is good that we are at least talking. So the community coming together is a requirement, is one of the good things that is happening. We have a global ambassadors program. Well, um, here is Ramon, here is Sergey over here, here is Ripi Singh. So you, you see all these people that you're hearing today are, are kind of engaged in making this happen together. And we are approaching it from an ecosystem perspective, simply because this is so complicated, or this is so interconnected and so complex that if an equipment manufacturer says, here is my artificial intelligence machine, take it. But the inspector is not trained, it will not go anywhere. You know, the, the manager doesn't want to buy it, it doesn't go anywhere. The regulator says, I don't understand, I will not certify it, it doesn't go anywhere. So all of these entities, all of these organizations, people who develop assets, you know, the Boeing, the Airbus, people who own the asset, the Air France, the inspectors, the people who make the NDT equipment, these are all primary stakeholders in making sure that the asset, the airplane is safe so that the consumer passenger is safe. And then there are others the R&D centers, the regulatory bodies, they all help the ecosystem. And then of course, on the outer end are people like me who have some insignificant influence, who give some talks to some schools here and there and think that this is good enough for me, right? So we, we, we are also trying to be a part of that system by creating some noise. But we all have to sort of work together to make something happen. 
For each stakeholder, the why may be slightly different, the what may be slightly different. In my talk, I shared with you why NDE 4.0 and what it entails. But for every individual stakeholder, it may be slightly different, right? So I will not uh, read these details in the interest of time. But just so you know, the whole idea is if the entire ecosystem, if the community comes together to work this transition to the next revolution, we can make it happen. And there's a good reason for everybody to adopt it. We are creating a global roadmap. We're creating a global roadmap from which major stakeholders can take their activities. They can develop the technologies, they can develop the skills. Uh, and this is something that the global community is doing for the entire ecosystem. The transformation is a journey. In the previous talk, Sergey asked a question to Ramon saying, how long will it take for the transformation to be complete? It is an extremely hard question to answer. In fact, some of us even struggle with defining what does it mean? And some of us, if we are already talking about industry 5.0, then before the 4.0 is done, there will be elements of 5.0 coming into the system. So there really is not a marker. It is not a milestone to achieve. There is no end point. It is simply a continuous transformation. So if you cannot define the end point, how can you define when will you get there? It's a journey. It's, it's like life, right? Yeah, in life we do retire, but we don't stop breathing. We don't stop eating. We just, it's a, we don't stop learning. We don't stop living, right? So this will go on pretty much. And one technology will come, will it get adopted, will become obsolete. New technology will come, adopted, obsolete. New skills will come, retrain, obsolete. We are in this cycle of continuous learning, developing, adapting, learning, developing, adapting with no specific end. But if we work together, and that's the only way to work, together is not just better, together is the only way. So with that, I close the how piece of it. How to go about, is it on process? Is it on community involvement? And thinking of it like a journey, okay? Let me summarize why we do it for safety and economy. What it is, it's digital technology and physical inspection systems. And how we go about doing it, using a proper business, engaging the community and taking a perspective of an ecosystem and a continuous journey rather than a specific endpoint. So I'll close with this. Who do you need to hire? I always ask CEOs this question. If a CEO wants to be a leader in the fourth industrial revolution, you go hire a chief innovation officer. If you want to be a follower, you go hire a chief risk officer so he can watch what to adopt when, when the risk becomes too much and now you must change. And if you are a leader who believes in observing, I can wait and watch. I don't need to make any change. Everything is good with me. I am making my profit. You are an observer. Some of them even close their eyes. They don't even want to observe. But if you're an observer or if you're closing your eyes, you need to hire a chief prayer officer because that's the only thing that can save you from the fourth industrial revolution. If you decide not to lead or not to follow, you better start praying because there is no immunity to this. We will survive COVID. We will not survive the fourth industrial revolution. I close with that. Sergey, you are muted. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ripi. I just want to show this. Okay, with all the people. So is there any question? Everybody can hear me, it's okay? Ripi, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so is there any questions in the room or in the 
audience from students from Blois or from students from Bourges? Yes. You have one. So Frédéric Vallée from IEEE, uh, past president from this French section, has a question for you. So probably, Frédéric, you, probably you can go here. I apologize. So you will have Okay. Hello, how are you? Hello. I have a question about uh, the scope of your research. Sometimes you speak of uh, uh, um, non-destructive evaluation, sometimes of inspection, and um, in the context of uh, system engineering, we speak of uh, verification and the validation. So I would like to know uh, and in verification and validation, we speak of um, EAD, IEDT, inspection, uh, demonstration, uh, analysis, and testing. So um, I, I would like to know if your work is uh, reduced to inspection or if you cover all the field of verification and validation of the uh, system engineering. Interesting question. So my background is aerospace engineering. I was a fracture mechanics person for about 10, 15 years. Then I came into corporate America and for 15 years I was managing various groups in aerospace and energy. I am not an NDT person. I do not develop NDT equipment or carry out NDT. I do not have an ASNT certification. My area of research is innovation management, innovation methods, why we should innovate, how we should innovate, what to go after. I happen to apply that to the inspection systems because I understood human factors and I understand airplane safety and I understand a few technical subjects. So if you ask me what my area of research is, my book just came out, which is around innovation purpose, and it has no mention of NDT at all. We, we don't talk about NDT. I, I rely on people like Ramon and Sergey and Johannes to bring me into the NDT field of it. To, to your question, do I look at systems? Yes, I do look at systems, but I look at those systems not from the validation perspective, but from design architecture perspective, from application user perspective. You know, the very early stage of how do you identify the need for a system and how do you develop the concepts of the system? And once those concepts are qualified and they become engineering R&D projects, I usually uh, do not go into that area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ripi. I have a question. I have a question for Ripi. Yeah, okay, Raman, come on. Yeah, yeah, Ripi. As I said before, I always learn a lot from you. And well, uh, following your, your uh, it was interesting, the notion that you had shared with us this, this, this morning, this evening, about the hierarchy of data and how uh, this will have an impact on redefining the change in several roles, you talk about CEOs and inspectors. How do you perceive the, uh, the acquisition of new skills and the redefining of roles will be evolving towards the future in the, let's say, the next three or five years? How do I see it? How do I see yeah. how, how do How do you perceive which, uh, how, how they will evolve and how it will be impacted by everything following this hierarchy of data model that you have presented, that it's not only about knowing that something failed, but also how to, de to decide and, and, and predict. Uh, so this is a, Ramon, this is a slightly difficult question. I may not have the right answer to what you're asking for. Honestly, I have not thought of it before and I do not have an answer right now. 
um, but I will look into it or we can, we can discuss it offline. It's, it's, it's not known to me yet. Yes, well, we don't know because it was for me very interesting the this uh, the hierarchy of data and, and and I think that it will have a a, a very strong impact on defining the the roles of, of many jobs all across the organizational structure. So it is it is very very interesting. I, I I agree with that. The roles will change significantly. The skills would change significantly how the work flows, how the structure happens will change significantly. And it will, it will have its inertia, it will have friction, it will be a little slower, you will have to go through training and reward and recognition, all of those traditional psychological tools to be deployed to make it happen. The biggest change we will see will go from hierarchical structure to what I call as a star structure, where yeah. your objectives are defined rather than job descriptions. I tell people, I tell leaders when they are hiring, stop writing job descriptions, start writing job expectations. Okay, let people figure it out. Let them let them figure it. There is so much knowledge out there. Don't tell them what to do. Tell them what is expected of them. They are smart. They will do it. Uh, there is another realm that I'm beginning to talk about. You know, we talk about data management. We talk about knowledge management. I also want you to think about, from an organization perspective, intelligence management. If on mm -hmm. the shop floor, you have humans and robots working together, in the conference room, you can have humans and AI working together. And that will change the game as to how we even flow the command structure, how we pass on the instructions. I, I do not have all the answers, but I know how to prepare ourselves for that. Yeah, uh, uh, well, actually, th this is important. Uh, at the end, it is uh, how these new models are rising as new new questions, and and this is the value of 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 of, of this this lecture. Uh, I, I I have learned a lot. Thank you, Ripi. Yeah, I, I I would say that I'm also at a point where I tell my clients, stop strategic planning. Strategic mm -hmm. planning will not work. Work on strategic readiness or whatever may evolve, okay? I think one thing that COVID has taught us is strategic planning can go, <laughs> can go down the toilet before you know it. People who survived were the ones who were ready for uncertainty, ambiguity, rapid change. Focus on strategic readiness rather than strategic planning. Yeah, you know, without, without talking previously with you, I, I totally agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, Repeat. Thank you, Ramon. I, it was very nice and uh, uh, thank you for both of you for the exchange that we had for this uh, uh, session. And uh, I hope that your talk will be inspiring for all our students which are present here. And uh, thank you. We will make a break. Thank you, Repeat, again. And congratulations again.